Hi, I'm Claire Guest and I'm Chief Executive and Director of Operations of the charity Medical Detection Dogs. And the charity started in 2008. We were originally called Cancer and Bio Detection Dogs because that's in fact where our roots came from. We trained the first cancer detection dogs in the world that indicated that dogs could indeed be trained to detect the odour of human cancer from a urine sample. Our training is all reward based and we use whatever the dog finds most motivating, either food or a toy. Often for cancer detection we actually use a food reward and the reason for this is you need the dog to concentrate very hard and in fact sometimes a toy reward can make the dog think more about the reward than what he's actually doing. Food reward and with the clicker, which is what we often use, is very calming and the dog thinks very hard about his decision before he, he gives an answer. Because one of the important things is you don't get something called false positives where dogs give you an answer because they just want to get hold of the, the toy and have a game. In addition to our team of biodetection detection dogs, we also now have a programme of medical assistance dogs. And these are dogs trained to recognise the specific odour that occurs just before this person has a medical emergency. The person is alerted to this medical emergency because they have an odour change that the dog is trained to recognise. And we collect odour from people when they're unwell. So what we do is, if somebody's having an acute episode, we would collect odour from them. Breath odour and sometimes perspiration. And this odour is then kept in a sterile environment until we're ready to train the dog. And we teach the dog that this is a very important and rewarding odour for them. Once the dog's learned to recognise the odour, the dog is then trained to alert the person. And this has to be a very clear indication to the person that something's about to happen. So that they can be completely sure that the dog is giving a, an alert and warning them of an oncoming emergency. So our dogs may be trained to paw, to stare, to tap at the person's hand and then if the dog is ignored they may go off and get the medical kit or they may in fact go and get another person to help. This happens particularly in the case of young children. What we find is because the type of dog we use is a very bonded dog and a dog that wants to be with people we're often able to use rescue dogs because sadly many dogs get into rescue because they're a bit overactive and they want to be with the person all the time and perhaps in that environment they can't be. So a lot of our dogs are rescued and unwanted and they come and they do a fantastic job. And when we started the charity we decided we were going to have a commitment to never putting a dog in kennels during training. So we have a complete no kennel policy which means that all our cancer dogs, our biodetection dogs are all fostered or live with trainers and they come into work Monday to Friday and then go home for the weekend. They all live completely normal lives, so in the evenings they're all sat on the sofas enjoying themselves in front of the fire. And all our medical assistance dogs are puppy walked, but instead of coming into kennels for the final part of the training, they stay with the puppy walker. And our trainers go out and do the training in the home. Now this works brilliantly in two or three ways. Firstly, the dog doesn't have to go through the stress of being in kennels. Secondly, our dogs learn immediately that the work they're doing is work in the home. It's not work in a specific training environment. This happens in the home environment where they, they understand that that's where they're going to be expected to work. And thirdly, what we find is because we're using odour samples from a client, because we're using odour samples from somebody who's going to be having that dog, it's almost as if we've been showing the dog photographs of that person for a number of weeks. So when they first meet the client, instead of the client being a totally new person that they've never seen before, they walk up to them and say, hey, I know you, because of course I know they know, that they know the person's odour. So the whole transition through training is very, very easy for the dog. And it means that luckily we're, very, we're able to train and keep dogs stress-free. And this means it's a win-win situation because the best dogs always get through. So what happens if a dog doesn't make it? Well, we have very few dogs that don't because we have so many different jobs that we can give dogs. But if they don't, they are, of course, rehomed. Often the puppy walker or the volunteer wants to keep them. And at the moment, we have dogs from a whole range of places. As I say, we use dogs from rescue. We also use donated dogs. Joby here was actually donated. And he was donated by the breeder who, tr who bred the first cancer detection dog for us. So Tangle is our British Medical Journal detector dog, and he's ten and a half now. And so Joby will be starting his training in a few months' time.
The dogs really enjoy this work. My feeling is that dogs that live alongside people with, with serious medical conditions can actually find the experience quite stressful because they're clearly aware of changes in that person. But until they're trained, there's no communication between the dog and the person. So the dog may be aware that an event's going to happen, but can't in fact communicate it to their owner. So when you give the dog the ability to communicate that this is about to happen through the alert, that the person is able to recognise, it actually reduces the stress in the dog. And of course also prevents this horrible stressful event where their owner is lying unconscious on the floor and the paramedics rush in and take them away to hospital. We start training our dogs at a variety of different ages. For our medical assistance dogs, of course, they go through puppy walking like any assistance dogs would. And then normally the odour recognition discrimination alert phase would take two to three months at the end of training. Because the work is, requires a mature dog, it does require a dog that's able to make clear decisions. And it's never driven by a command. Of course, the dog has to offer the behaviour itself. So we're very careful that we do a lot of clicker training and a lot of teach the dog to be, very, to be problem solvers, to be able to offer behaviours throughout their, their puppyhood. So we, we don't place dogs um, or work dogs as, as, as qualified cancer detection dogs until they're about um, 16 months of age to ensure that they're fully mature and that they're able to focus and concentrate on their work. But up until that time, the dog will have enjoyed a whole range of discrimination games hide-and-seek games, finding games, and it will be later on in training that I'll actually be working on the, the actual odour that we'll be training them to recognise for the future. Because we're a new charity, we haven't got an exact age of retirement. Of course, it will be a very individual thing, so each dog will be assessed how much he's enjoying his work as an older dog and what his abilities are. But one thing we'll be very careful about doing is making sure that dogs are able to live happy retirement with their owners and trainers. The dogs don't seem to lose their olfactory capability as they get older. It's often been said that probably the nose is a bit like you know, eyesight and hearing and it probably deteriorates. We're not actually noticing that at the moment. It may be in some of our much older dogs as we grow as a charity we will see this, but certainly olfaction seems to be one of the last things to be affected. With the cancer detection dogs we've made it quite clear that we don't uh, encourage the dogs to indicate on, on people. That's why they're trained in a very specific environment to samples. So if you like it's the opposite of the blood sugar dog. The blood sugar dog's trained in the home environment right from the start and he's taught that this odour of blood sugar is going to occur where you are at home and when you're at home or out and about you need to alert to it. For the cancer dogs it's the opposite. We're saying Ignore this odour at any other situation, but if you're in this room and the samples are presented to you, then please alert. And by this way, in this way, we're able to prevent the dog from giving an alert out and about, because of course this would be rather unethical, because although um, we may have reason to believe that the dog is indicated for a reason, we're of course not able to give a diagnosis to someone or uh, explain to them where their cancer might be or explain to them about their treatment process. So we have had a couple of situations where dogs have given alerts, cancer dogs have given alerts, um, but we've not, we've not ever said anything, but actually the person has, has on both occasions noted that the dog has been taking particular interest and has actually offered the information that they have, they have got cancer. The blood sugar dogs is different. The dogs will indicate blood sugar wherever they are, but what we try and do is teach them only to alert the owner. So. Although we'll be aware that the dog may smell a blood sugar change in the person next door, they will only alert their owner if the blood sugar change occurs in their owner because that's the only rewarded behaviour. So the other behaviours all go to extinction. Mm -hmm.